There is absolutely no lack of content or research when it comes to the First World War. However, once you start to look a bit closer, you'll see that some aspects often get left out, while others seem to be in the very centre of attention. One such aspect would be the fighting on the Western Front, which evokes a very clear picture in the public memory. However, ask most people on the street about what happened on the Eastern Front and they'll know pretty much nothing about it, as it's often left out in the general conversation. What also gets left out a lot is the history of the civilians who had to live through this conflict and in some cases even lived in a region that was occupied by another country. Today we're going to try and remedy this situation at least a tiny bit by talking about the German occupation of Poland in the First World War, which lasted for more than three years and had a significant impact on its population, for better and for worse. Before we move on, a very quick word from today's sponsor, CyberGhost VPN. Using the free public Wi-Fi provided on trains and in some cafes might be very tempting, but can very quickly become a huge risk. Data breaches and malware infections could just be one click away from making you lose important data. But don't worry, because this won't happen to you with CyberGhost VPN. With CyberGhost, your data is routed through an encrypted VPN tunnel and encrypted in this way. Your IP address is also hidden, making you even more anonymous on the internet. It has over 11,000 servers in 100 countries you can connect to within just a few seconds. This allows you to access content that might be locked in your country, be it on Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, Disney+, whatever you wish. CyberGhost VPN is available for all platforms, Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, Smart TV and even gaming consoles. With one single subscription you can protect up to 7 devices, something your friends and family will definitely appreciate. CyberGhost has over 38 million users worldwide and an excellent rating on Trustpilot. There's also 24-7 customer support in case you run into any issues. If this sounds like something for you, click on the first link in my description where you can get CyberGhost for just $2.03 per month and an extra 4 months for free which is just an amazing deal honestly. Don't worry about trying it out, because there is a 40 day money back guarantee, so it's totally risk free. Start protecting yourself today. The occupation of Poland began in May 1915, when the Central Powers began a new offensive under German leadership. After a long artillery barrage, the Russian forces got overrun and were forced to retreat backwards. On the 4th of June, Przemysl was captured by Bavarian troops. Lemberg was retaken a few weeks later and on the 5th of August the city of Warsaw was captured. After the end of the so-called Gorlice Tarnów offensive, all of the territories that had encompassed Congress Poland were under control of the central powers. The inhabitants of Warsaw held mixed feelings regarding the arrival of German troops. As you can see on this picture, there were crowds of people who greeted the German soldiers and who seemed quite happy. However, many Varsovians were also worried about their future. They didn't know what would come next and how the departure of the Russian administration would affect them. Warsaw's Jewish population was about the only one who overwhelmingly cheered for the new arrivals. They could communicate with German soldiers in Yiddish and hoped that the era of anti-Semitic policies imposed by Tsarist Russia would finally be over. The German occupiers transferred control over the city to a Pole, namely Szczesław Lubomirski, who became its president. In general, the attitude towards the local Poles was not domineering, but marked by respect and the German authorities transferred certain powers to them. They also made some very, very bright promises. German and Polish would both be used in administration, compulsory education for children was to be introduced and Polish political groups were legalised. Furthermore, the Julian calendar was replaced by the Georgian one, the ruble was abolished and replaced by the mark, and a new passport was introduced in which the nationality of Russian was replaced by Pole. The historian Jan Dombrowski would later write, In this way, one of the greatest and most lasting changes brought about by the world war in Europe took place. At the same time, the foundations were laid for the return of an undivided Poland after the failure of the November uprising. Not everything was bright, however. At the exact same time, all potato stocks in Warsaw were confiscated and the export of goods like zinc, leather, cotton and linen products was prohibited so that the occupying powers could have full control over all the country's resources. Already in the first few weeks, the German Austrian rule was seen as a double-edged sword. You had political and cultural freedoms on one side 
and then economic control and exploitation on the other. Shortly after, the area of former Russian Congress Poland was split into two so-called general governments. The general government of Warsaw under German control was slightly bigger and included most of the important industrial and urbanized areas such as Warsaw and Łódź. The general government of Lublin under Austrian rule was slightly smaller and considerably less populous and included mostly farmlands and smaller cities. The remainder of this video will not be in chronological order because it would just be confusing and it makes much more sense to look at the various aspects of the occupation by themselves. I will also only talk about the German occupation zone and leave Austria out for now because I would rather go into a bit more detail with one country instead of trying to cramp both into one video. Sorry if that disappoints you. The five aspects that we'll be looking at today are the following. General attitude towards Poles and Jews political administration and participation, education and culture, economy, and finally, labor. Officially, the Poles were considered to be friends by the German occupiers. Hans von Beseler, the general governor of Warsaw, often praised the Polish population. He commended their hard work and their patriotism and considered the Russian mismanagement to be the main cause of Poland's withered physical, mental and political development. He also considered them to be a part of the Western cultural sphere and to be a bulwark against the uncultured East. However, he got very upset over the Polish demands for an independent state, as he deemed them to be immature and unrealistic. As the years went on and as the matter of independence got increasingly complicated, after the proclamation of the Polish Kingdom in November 1916, von Bezala's attitude became increasingly negative and almost bitter. He began to use derogatory language and described the country as backwards, old-fashioned, disorganized and just generally inferior. This change of attitude comes from strange expectations he had when he became the governor general. He thought of himself and of other Germans as liberators from Russian rule and was probably hoping for more gratitude and praise. Instead, Germany was viewed with a high degree of distrust. The unwillingness of most Poles to fight or work for the German war effort offended him deeply, which is why he became rather resentful. Still, he was far, far away from the racial thinking process that would develop 20 years later. Instead, in his eyes, Germany should see it as a mission to educate and elevate the Poles to equal, civilized citizens. Active racism against Poland's Jewish population was unseen, but they were still not spared from prejudices. At the time of the occupation, the Jewish population in the general government numbered over 2 million. Again, similarly to the Poles, the Jews were often seen as inferior because of the backwardness caused by Russian rule. This is largely due to the fact that well into the early 20th century, many Jews, apart from a small layer of accultured and wealthy members of the Polish bourgeoisie, lived a conservative lifestyle with a distinct type of clothing and often lived in urban areas, where they were still largely segregated from the Polish population. Many German Jews, who were mostly accultured and called themselves mainly German, also held this view of the Ostjuden or Eastern Jews as backwards and in urgent need of reform and education. In a paper published in October 1915, the German Association for the Interests of Eastern European Jews, an anti-Zionist group advocating for the assimilation of Jews into Polish society, wrote it has been called into question whether it is possible to educate Eastern European Jews, especially those Jews in Poland, to become useful citizens leading any kind of civic life in the modern sense. There is no doubt that one has to concede that the Jews in the Russian border provinces in many respects find themselves in a regrettable condition of cultural undevelopment. In general, despite many negative and paternalistic prejudices, no systematic discrimination of Jews took place during the occupation. Instead, the main effort was placed on thinking about how they could be better integrated into Polish society and be turned into proper citizens. The general government of Warsaw was administered as follows. The general governor, Hans von Bieseler, was at the very top of the hierarchy, only being subordinate to the Kaiser and he held all military and ruling powers. Wolfgang von Kries was responsible for the civilian administration. Very quickly, the state apparatus was expanded. 
The civilian administration was initially led by only 26 German civil servants, but that number would grow to about 9,000 until the end of the war. To finance all this, the general governor was allowed to tax the population within the legal framework. In general, the German occupiers followed a policy of concessions to keep the population happy and to demonstrate political generosity. This was largely done in the hope that the Poles would be swayed to their side and would let them get away with more strict economic demands. One such concession was the establishment of a city council in Warsaw, something which many of the Soviets have demanded for over 50 years. Warsaw was also the only city that was ruled by a Polish president, whereas all the other cities were ruled by German mayors. The council was elected by a Curia voting system, which gave the wealthy and educated classes an obvious advantage, and thus did not fairly represent the city's population. Still, it was largely celebrated by the Polish population, and seen as a predecessor to a national parliament. The council was responsible for the schools, the city budget, the maintenance of the streets, the hospitals and social welfare, so quite a big roster indeed. Keep in mind, however, that Warsaw would remain the only city that received such a degree of self-rule and autonomy. On the state level, cooperation with the Poles would remain a difficult topic. A few months after the proclamation of an independent Polish state in 1916, a provisional state council consisting of 25 members was formed. This council, however, had only very few powers and was only entitled to state their wishes, which could always just be ignored. This council was short-lived, as it stepped down in protest over the incarceration of Józef Piłsudski after he had refused an oath to the Kaiser. In its place, a three-headed Regency Council, consisting of the President of Warsaw, Szczesław Lubomirski, the Archbishop of Warsaw, Aleksander Karkowski, and the politician Józef Ostrowski, was introduced. Germany was very keen to keep these representative bodies loyal. In 1918 alone, it had granted the Regency Council and the other Polish ministries around 30 million marks. This was also done with the intention of possibly buying their favour. Still, the matter over which authorities the Polish politicians would receive remained completely unsolved. The German authorities and the Polish representatives had vastly different ideas on how much power each side should hold. The occupiers never wanted equal partners, but instead simply needed yes-men who carried out their orders and kept the population happy. A real integration of Poles into the German power structure never took place, and as such the initial goal of securing loyalty for the German Empire was never achieved. On the other hand, vocal critics and dissidents were often punished severely. The most famous example is probably that of Józef Piłsudski, who got arrested and then sent to Magdeburg Fortress after he had stopped cooperating with the Germans and urged his soldiers to actively deny loyalty to the Kaiser. In the end, this helped him actually to portray himself as a staunch anti-imperialist and as a Polish national hero. There was also an incident in Łódź when numerous politicians from the city council criticised the failed duplicitous policy of the central powers, and the general government responded by imposing a hefty fine of 100,000 marks and by court-martialing some of the representatives. Still, it was very far from a cruel and inhumane occupation. The use of violence was restricted whenever possible, and it remained surprisingly low until the end of the war. Apart from the destruction of the border town of Kalish and the execution of hundreds of civilians in summer 1914, there are no records of murder against the Polish population. Compared to other German occupation regimes, such as the one in Belgium, the German rule over Poland remained staggeringly mild. This can be explained by the desire of the central powers in general to be seen as liberators and to gain the Poles as allies. Strikes were still allowed and both sides usually chose to de-escalate any conflicts that might have emerged. Criticism was possible, but severely restricted. And still, distrust and unhappiness generally prevailed and made actual cooperation very, very difficult. One example where cooperation actually worked very, very well was that of the University of Warsaw. You see, Warsaw hadn't had a Polish university since the late 1860s. Following the failed uprising of 1863, the Russian Empire had slowly transformed the Szkoła Główna into an instrument of Russification where Russian professors taught classes in Russian to an increasingly Russian audience. 
When the German army arrived, hopes were high that an actual Polish university might be re-established. The head of the civilian administration, Wolfgang von Kries, supported this idea, arguing that it might put Germany into a better light and that it might make young people very, very happy. Already in September of 1915, so one whole year before the promise of bringing back a Polish state, von Kries attempted to convince von Bieseler by stating that Germany does not intend to keep this land forever, but rather wishes to bind it permanently to itself. It must be well administered, it must have good civil servants, jurists, physicians, engineers, architects, technicians, indeed even philosophers. It is important that the Poles, when they one day assume the administration of the state, have the necessary specialists. And so, on the 15th of November, the university was ceremoniously reopened and over 1,000 students signed up for the first semester. When 1916 came about and it became increasingly clear that Poland would become a German vassal state, the University of Warsaw took over the role as the place where the country's future elite would be trained. This fits well into the previously discussed view the German administrators held towards the Poles. They believed that the yet immature and backwards Polish population could be moulded into a well-educated pro-German way of life. And for a while, a period of stability ensued. The number of students and professors increased, student associations flourished, and on the 3rd of May 1916 a huge parade was held to celebrate the 125th anniversary of the 1791 constitutions, where students marched waving the Polish flag. And this parade was important because national celebrations like these would have been unthinkable under Russian rule. The day began with the unveiling of a memorial plaque and with the announcement by city president Lubomirski that certain streets in Warsaw would be renamed in honour of those who had forged the first written constitution of Europe. Shortly after, a parade marched through the city. As one contemporary noted, And so this huge crowd of people, with their flags and banners sparkling in the sun, marched through the beautifully decorated streets in glorious, almost summery weather, and in a silence and contemplation befitting the special moment. Around 300,000 people took part in the procession, and at least as many, if not more, were present as spectators at the roadside, in the windows, on the balconies, and even on the roofs of the houses. Cultural life also flourished in the city. A big number of theatres and opera houses remained open, even if some plays were subject to strict censorship, or were in some cases even outright forbidden. However, this phase of calm and tranquility was only short-lived, as trouble quickly ensued. The university students were, for the most part, highly political and usually aligned with nationalist thoughts. Many of them were willing to cooperate with the German Empire, as they considered Russia to be the main enemy of Polish national ambitions. However, when the Tsar got overthrown in February 1917 and the Petrograd Soviet granted Poland the right of independence, the Central Powers were suddenly considered the main enemy. Additionally, the American president, Woodrow Wilson, had also declared his intentions of re-establishing a Polish state. As such, tensions and anger were quickly rising among the students. A student strike broke out in spring after clashes occurred between protesting students and German soldiers. For a while, the university was closed, but later reopened after some negotiations, which granted the university some more autonomy. After the war had ended, Hans von Bieseler claimed that the university would serve as a constant reminder to the Poles of the great blessings that German occupation had brought them. Whether he really believed this, or if he just said it to justify his policy, remains doubtful. Because while concessions were made in education and in politics, Poland was being ruthlessly exploited on an economic basis. Against the protests from the civilian administrator Wolfgang von Kries, the military plundered or confiscated tens of thousands of tons of goods, including 20,000 tons of cotton, 65,000 tons of metal, and 164,000 tons of minerals in the first few months following the arrival of German troops. Later, when it became clear that the occupation would last quite a bit longer than expected, the ruthless exploitation of the lands was stopped in favour of a more thoughtful way of dealing with Poland's natural resources. Rations were introduced, and a system was developed in which goods were bought from Polish farmers at a set price. The task of supplying the area and Germany with food was even transferred to Polish authorities in July of 1917. This price that they paid was very low, however, and many farmers actually preferred to sell their goods on the black market. 
As such, the food deliveries fell far below the expectations, but Germany had no means of fixing this problem. They couldn't steal these goods anymore as they wanted to be seen as liberators of the Polish nation. The general government was also chronically understaffed, the delivery routes were way too long and inefficient, which caused food to rot on the way, and corruption became a widespread issue. As such, only 530,000 tons of food were delivered to Germany throughout the entire war. This might sound like a lot, but it was actually only 0.5% of the annual German production. As such, each German only received about 3 kilograms of Polish produce per year on average. Still, and rightfully so, this was seen as an exploitative system by the Poles, who often suffered from hunger. The industrial city of Łódź, for example, which had always been dependent on food imports from the surrounding area, was hit especially badly. The introduction of ration cards had increased the prices by about 13 times, which forced many people to leave the city. From the initial 630,000 people, only 342,000 were left at the end of the war. Throughout the entire general government, the rations were constantly decreased. In the big cities, people initially had access to 150 grams of flour per day. By 1918, that number dropped to 90 grams, of which 20 grams were cheap extenders. Meat lovers also had to cut down on their consumption from 70 grams per week in 1916 to just 40 grams in 1918. But hey, at least the potato rations got increased, so that's that. Wood also quickly became an important resource for the Germans following the occupation. Even though Poland was a land relatively poor in woodlands, the general government quickly began with the ruthless exploitation of the Russian state forests in the interests of the German economy and the army. The German army urgently needed wood for the construction of railways, roads and bridges, for the construction of a telegraph and telephone system, for the construction of front fortifications and shelters as well as for firewood. And they really needed that wood. Every month the amount of trees felled increased and most of the wood got exported to Germany. As a whole, the general government chopped down four times more trees than had been usual in Poland before the war. During a state visit in Berlin, the Polish minister-president Jan Kuchaszewski voiced his concerns. It seems as if a deforestation is being carried out in a way that threatens to deplete the forest stock. Therefore, the Polish government's concern is not unfounded that it could be deprived in this way of the not insignificant support that the state forests can offer to the future national budget. As a result, wood became rather scarce for the Polish population and either became really expensive or outright unavailable. Other than grain, potatoes and wood, only few other goods were of much economic relevance to the Germans. Of course you had the coal from the Dąbrowa Basin in southern Poland. However, if you look at this graph, you can see that only a minuscule amount of the coal that was mined actually got exported to Germany. That was mainly because Germany's domestic coal production was far more efficient and the country didn't rely on the Dąbrowa coal. To summarize it all, the economic exploitation was mostly restricted to agricultural and forest goods. The last thing I want to talk about is the matter of forced or unfree labor. Following the German occupation of Poland, the country had a huge unemployment problem. Fearing that this might cause issues or riots, the German occupiers began to recruit unemployed Poles to work on tasks such as railway construction, road maintenance, forestry or in agriculture. The work was usually tough and only people who were sort of robust could carry it out. The wage was also low and the conditions were often abysmal. Still, it was better than being unemployed and most workers signed up voluntarily. In March of 1916, around 83,000 Polish men were employed by the general government. Simultaneously, Germany suffered from a shortage of workers because many able-bodied men were forced to go to war. As such, incentives were put in place for Poles to work in Germany. Here's a recruitment poster from Warsaw in 1916. Announcement. Men, boys, women and girls aged 14 to 45 are wanted for agricultural work in Saxony, Hannover, Pomerania, Westphalia, Brandenburg, Silesia, Rhineland and Posen. Below is a table stating the wages for certain time periods. The workers usually signed up on their own accord and without force. The thing is, though, the local recruiters made promises that were simply too good to be true. They spoke of higher wages than in Poland and of support for their families. 
After having signed a temporary contract, they got examined for illnesses and then transported in groups to Germany. Upon their arrival in Germany, the Polish workers often realized that they got cheated. The accommodations were often subpar, the food was terrible, and the promised wages were not paid in full. There was also the fact that people were not allowed to return back to Poland once they had arrived in Germany. There was some protest, like from the member of the Reichstag, Władysław Seda, who called out the unfair treatment of workers and that they should have the right to defend their interests. In total, however, very little was done to improve their situation. Despite the many bad reports that reached the motherland, many people had no choice but to sign up when faced with hunger. Between 1914 and 1917, around 200,000 people had gone to Germany for work. Most of them worked in some factory or in the mining sector, and they were usually men. Most of the women and younger men worked on farms. However, these measures weren't enough to solve the lack of workers in Germany and the unemployment crisis in occupied Poland. So when Paul von Hindenburg and Erich Ludendorff took over Central Army Command in summer 1916, they pushed for more strict work measures, one of which included forced labour to combat work shyness, as they called it. These forced recruitments were carried out all over the general government and were not conducted in a systematic, but rather in an arbitrary way. People were usually sent to camps where they were given the choice to either go to Germany for work, voluntarily, or to be sent to some work battalion. The goal was not necessarily to physically force everyone to work in some shitty job, but rather to scare the general population into signing up voluntarily. There was also some resistance, like when the Warsaw City Council simply refused to hand over a list of unemployed people to the German administration. It is pretty much impossible to estimate just how many people were forcefully recruited. The official number stands around 5,000, of whom most were Jewish Poles. Some authors have claimed that the number must have been in the hundreds of thousands, which is most certainly hyperbole. The idea to force people to work was a terrible one. Remember, Germany wanted to be seen as a friend and as a liberator, and practically enslaving people is not the way to achieve that. As the district chief of Częstochowa put it, the Germans have undoubtedly made themselves thoroughly unpopular and hated by the Poles. As such, after just three months, the policy was completely abandoned. In the last two war years, a more subtle sticks and carrot method was used to motivate people to work. This meant that workers in Germany were given more choices on where they could work and were given the right to go on one holiday per year. However, only very few could make use of that privilege, as the employer could always just deny it if he deemed you not trustworthy. Simultaneously, people in Poland were often forced to work whenever the local area showed a lack of workers, especially in agriculture, even though it remained on a much, much smaller scale. So, how should we conclude this? After having looked at all these different aspects, it becomes very clear that Poland was one thing, and one thing only to the German occupiers an imperial possession. They saw its people as inferior, and considered it their mission to civilize and to elevate them. They also exploited the area as much as they could. The Polish woods were chopped down relentlessly, and food was exported in big quantities which left many people hungry. Hundreds of thousands of people were also sent to Germany under very questionable conditions, and for a short period of time forced labor became an official policy. However, one can quickly tell that the way Poland was ruled was mostly pragmatic and not marked by ideological or racial ideas. The administrators in the general government thought in the long term and wanted to pave the way for a Poland in the future German sphere of influence. A genuine effort was made to gain the favour of the Poles and the anti-Polish policies that Prussia had followed before the war were just not implemented in the general government. The thought of Germanizing the land never came up. There were also many concessions in politics and education, and Warsaw gained quite a considerable amount of autonomy. This careful and often very sensible approach thus stands in very stark contrast to what would happen a bit more than 20 years later, when a genocidal German regime based on racial superiority attempted to erase the Polish nation as a concept, destroyed the country completely, enslaved hundreds of thousands of its people, and committed the most terrible and heinous crime humanity had ever seen. Anyway, that's all for today. As always, a big Dankeschön for watching and I hope you liked the video and you learned something useful. If you did, a like and a subscribe would be much appreciated. 
I would like to give a huge and heartfelt shout out to my kind supporters over on Ko-Fi. A Cup of Tea, Tristan Kriegsmann, Ryan Leighton, Philipp Marchewka, Marius Gerling, the Grand Duke of Zealand, Luca Drohle and Wienwe. You are absolutely phenomenal. Have a very nice day and see you next time. Don't forget to click on the description link to get the special discount Cybercoast VPN is granting to my viewers. This application will protect your data while you browse and give you full access to all blocked content on the internet for $2.03 a month only. Totally risk-free, so check it out. Link in the description.